one fine day Love came for me And love was rare As love can be You've joined the Betamax Video Club, rewinding back to our favourite films of the 1980s. My name's Rich Nelson, and today I've rented Splash. Watching it with me is Taylor Glenn, who's a drunk woman solving crime at the Drunk Woman Solving Crime podcast. Hi, Taylor. How are you? Hey, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me on. No, it's my pleasure. Now, unfortunately, this wasn't your first choice film, because you're from Pittsburgh, right? Oh, how did you find that out? Did I tell you that? Wait, you're a police officer. This is creepy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the discussion about Flashdance. Oh, that's right. That's why I told you. I was like, oh my gosh, you've been through my files, Rich. Jeez, you have high I to, clearance. I have to vet my guests. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I'm a big... I'm a big fan of, well, ripping that movie apart, but with reverence. Like, I'm very fond of it. And like a lot of 80s films, it's just that thing of like, when you watch it later, you go, how did I take this at face value? How did I accept <laughs> this? This is very much, if I had thought through it, though, I think this splash would have been my first choice because it was my very favorite film as a kid. So it's kind of a no brainer. So we landed on the right one. Oh, brilliant. And yeah. um Pardon the pun, let's dive right in. So we are talking about a film from 1984 about mm -hmm. a guy who falls in love with a mermaid. Yeah. So rooted in truth. Absolutely grounded, yeah. Now, when we spoke about it beforehand, you said that it was creepy. Now, <laughs> I watched the film for the first time in years, a couple of days ago. Yeah. And bloody hell, you're right. It really was, wasn't it? It's not the sweet, child-friendly love story you uh, you remember. No, and it's, um, you know, thankfully there are certain characters that I hope are getting retired in films in this age of Me Too, <laughs> where it's <laughs> like, I love John Candy, you know, he's one of my favorite comic actors, but you realize like the first scene with this little boy throwing change under women's skirts and looking up them, there's this like 80s character, like the adorable pervert, and we love <laughs> him. And yeah, so that's like, for starters, that's really dodgy. And it, because he goes on to be an adult that still does that trick. Oh, because <laughs> once a womanizer, always a womanizer. So there's that. But you know, yeah, so much went over my head because I was I was quite young when my parents let me watch this. And it's this stuff that just goes over your head. Like, I mean, for starters, so let's just lay it out here. So we've got Tom Hanks, who's great who's playing this guy, Alan. And it, apart from the creepy John Candy scene, it's one of my favorite opening sequences in a, in a film because Alan is a little boy. Tom Hanks' character is a little boy, falls overboard, um, and he's underwater, and he sees this little girl who's underwater, this beautiful little mermaid, and they hold hands, and they just feel this instant connection. And you realize that Alan, for some reason, is fine underwater. You know, as long as he's holding her hands, he seems to be able to breathe underwater. And then they rescue him and he writes it off as like a near death experience and he hallucinated this little girl and then fast forward we meet alan in the modern the modern new york of 1984 and he's running this he runs a big vegetable stand right see i'm going on memory so <laughs> i've just seen it so many times that i remember <laughs> the details and yes his brother who's john candy is still a pervert haha -ha, and alan has been unlucky in love so we sort of set the stage and he ends up encountering this mermaid again played by daryl hannah who can i just say i wanted to be her <laughs> oh i wanted to be her so She's badly. stunning i mean what a stunning character but the thing the first thing that went over my head as a kid is so she helps him because he gets hit by a boat. He goes back to Cape Cod to revisit his childhood, you know, vacation spot. He gets hit by a boat, passes out, and he wakes up on the shore and somebody has saved him. And it's this mermaid that he doesn't realize is a mermaid. But she ends up going into the city just wearing nothing. She gets arrested for public nudity. They give her like an I Love New York City t-shirt. And because she's got Alan's wallet, they contact him. So he takes her home and they can't communicate. So for all he knows, she's just this like refugee <laughs> from somewhere. They they don't speak and they have sex in the elevator. And you, it's just implied because they show the elevator going up. He's in this like awesome New York apartment and the elevator stops. And when I was a kid, I remember thinking like, oh, no, they never made it up to his apartment. <laughs> That's too bad. They might have had a kiss up there. And then 
watched it again. I'm like, oh, he just had sex with a woman who can't speak, who's confused and like possibly mentally ill. This is this is not right. <laughs> I wonder if this is the 1980s thing where this is every guy's dream, where a stunning woman comes out of nowhere, doesn't speak, and will have sex with you at the drop of a hat in a lift. Well, exactly. I, it's sort of this thing of um, the things that seem so romantic. I'm like, oh, she wasn't in a very empowered role, was she? <laughs> She's vulnerable. She's just been arrested. She just needs a, <laughs> yeah. needs a knight in shining armour. And you've got Tom Hanks, who... Obviously, we we look at now with reverence. Oh and, yes, yeah. You know, oh, he's, he's Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. In fact, on the Me Too thing, I was sitting around with friends the other night, and it's like each person who sort of their true colors get revealed when these women come forward or men come forward to say, "Oh no, they've assaulted me." There's a lot of that happening right now, and I said to my friends, "I'm like, if that happens with Tom Hanks, like I'm done. I'm just done. <laughs> I couldn't." I couldn't take it like Tom Hanks and in this era I had a big crush on Tom Hanks because he's just such a sweetie and he's cute and now Tom Hanks is like he's the dad that we all want isn't he yeah he's, he's just so he's so nice he's so nice moral fiber yes so that would kill us if anything came out but I don't think it will I believe in Hanks I believe in Hanks yeah hopefully he's had his fingers burned with this mermaid issue and he's you know he's thought about his life choices because this wasn't long before Big, and um, right, I right. guess then he was playing 12-year-old in a adult Tom Hanks body, yeah, and yeah, he seemed a lot, yeah. lot more innocent, and there was a whole bit about him having sex for the first time, and it was all very <laughs> funny. Yeah, again, something that was just over my head. <laughs> and then he's like <laughs> leaping through the hallway the next day. Yeah, yeah. This is the thing with 80s films, you look through them with the modern lens, and you sort of go, oh. I've done that with so many John Hughes films. Like if you watch 16 Candles again, it's racist, it's sexist, it's rapey. Like it's all the 80s. It's like the 80s triple threat. It's funny. We talked about that in the Breakfast Club episode. Mm. It just devolved. It devolved. I think this was before Molly Ringwald's essay about her experience on the film. But we we talked about it and it was just like she was 16 getting harassed by judd nelson yeah. who was yeah. what, in his mid to late 20s i think and that was just uncomfortable and that was just watching it exactly and that's you know they cut so many they decided not to film a scene in that again she writes about it in the essay sorry i'm taking us off into different films but um no, no. it's just this common thread with films of that time isn't it like john hughes wanted to do this big like shower scene where for some reason the girls in the breakfast club were all gonna get naked and take a shower and they were gonna like peep in on them and he was going to turn it into Porky's. And it's like, no, you actually have like a kind of poignant, profound film with a few creepy bits. But it actually, I think that one holds up pretty well. It was like, you would have ruined it with that. <laughs> well, in this one, they do have a what you hope is a gratuitous bath scene. That was when Madison, the, the fish woman, um, yeah. she goes for a bath in, in his house. And yes. he gets really angry that, you know, this beautiful woman he's just had sex with is in the bathroom and not opening the door straight away. Madison? Alan? <laughs> yeah, of course it's Alan. What are you doing, sweetheart? Taking a bath. Mm-hmm. Can I come in? No! What was that? Ma- Madison, are you alright? Everything's fine. Well, then let me in. I'm, I'll be right there. I'm just changing. Enough is enough, Madison. Come on, open the door. Something is wrong. Alan, can you make me some pancakes? Make you some... Madison? All right, Madison, this is getting scary. You either open up this door or I'm going to break it down. No, Alan, please. All right, that's it. Alan, no! No! Yes! Oh my God, like how dare you have privacy in the bathroom? What's going on? And he he kicks down the door? He kicks the door? Because how dare a woman take more than five minutes in a bath? Yeah. (laughs) You know, if this was today, she'd be playing her five lives of Candy Crush and everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've you've, you've got to have a little bit of peace and freedom. And that anger that you're you're in my bathroom, what are you doing? It's yeah. just, again, the anger was, just came out of nowhere. And it was one of these, maybe it is a rare Tom Hanks role where you actually think, mm, yeah, not not sure about you. Well, 
And yet there's a part of me, like, first of all, I'm appalled that it only has three stars on IMDb. Can I just throw it out there? Because 10 year old me needs to hold on to this film and overlook the like creepy be parts because I still love the story at the heart of it. This splash is basically, do you know what I realized? It's basically the shape of water without the art house feel. Well, I, I haven't seen that because God forbid that's a newish film, isn't it? And... <laughs> it's basically like the female reboot. So instead of Alan played by Tom Hanks, you have a female character and you have like a male mermaid, um, but they have much more consensual sex. It's very consensual. There's no like Phew. iffy areas. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose this is the the awkward thing where you know essentially it's a love story, a uh, an interspecies love story. Mm -hmm. Now I suppose you can get away with it being a, a mermaid because she's still half human. I mean, it could have taken a really dark turn. It yeah, been like a dog or something. Well, or imagine that it was just the reverse, and like she had the head of a fish and the legs and the genitalia of a woman. I mean, that that's where it gets really dicey when you <laughs> when you reverse. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I can't help but I love her, but she is the head of a fish, but everything else is fine. It's where it should be. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have I still have such a fondness for it. Um and I've just seen it so many times. I can't believe how much I can remember about it just going on memory. Now I'm gonna have to rewatch it. But I did I watched it about I would say about two years ago is the last time I saw it. Well th and... this was the first time I'd seen it in Yeah. Like in full for at least twenty, twenty five years. Oh wow. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah problems yeah it was a confronting watch for me but can we talk about how awesome eugene levy is oh and yes it? him and his eyebrows oh i still use that so his catchphrase was what a week i'm having and i still <laughs> say that all the time hopefully you're and, not having as bad a week as he's having no i'm not getting like whiplash and breaking my leg and stuff but i love because it's all silly physical comedy and it could have been really stupid if it was but it's eugene levy so he can just make anything funny and he just commits to it and his face and his expressions and you just love this ridiculous villain <laughs> so because still holds up. It, it's funny because this was um i mean this came out in 84 so same year as ghostbusters really and um and it had basically a theme of and he was a discredited scientist um mm -hmm. trying to basically get his shot at a big time by outing a mermaid which right. is fuck me i'm using these words outing a mermaid um <laughs> <laughs> and um you know he's being shunned by his peers and and everything else and all you know he wants to have this big splash on whatever those shopping checkout newspapers like the weekly world news or something like mm -hmm. that i met the mermaid yeah and that that's his mission and you know again he comes across initially as this dislikable villain and yet you know luckily for him and and i guess those who came to eugene levy a little bit later on know him as jim's dad he does save the day ish with some more misfortune for himself yeah I mean, because he kidnapped oh, it's this whole contrived event at the a dinner with the president, because, of course, Tom Hanks being yeah. I, did, I did the maths. He's 28 in this film. Is he? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, he's a baby. So he's 28. He's running a fairly healthy sized fruit and vegetable wholesalers in the yeah. docks with yeah. the cliched Teamsters and all that. Yeah. And um, so he's having one of these big dinners with the president and it's like in the line of fire. Eugene Levy comes out with his water cannons under his yes. bellboy jacket. It's ridiculous. But um, Yeah, I remember. <laughs> but just that scene at the end where he finally, after, you know, trying it on with the same couple a couple of times and getting yeah. is it a punch and a broken arm or something like that. He gets her. And doesn't he go, behold, the mermaid. Is that the line? Like, again, yeah. going just just as <laughs> just as he's carted off and the the world's press and the secret service and the government jump on and wait why is tom hanks there has he supplied the vegetables like what's his link to the president why is he there i mean that's I, I wrote it down just going how the <laughs> do they not even explain that they're like we'll just throw this into the plot we need to up the stakes it's a presidential dinner we need to show how important he is he run but Okay, he's a wholesaler. I, I mean, okay. Sometimes they invite the community. I don't know. <laughs> it was, maybe it's one of these where you got to pay ten thousand dollars a plate or something like that, and maybe because you know, he he was going to go with John Candy, wasn't he? And I think he had to sort of say, look, I'm I'm bumping you, the fellow owner of this company. Oh, for, 
okay. There's like, because his brother's really successful. I, ju- I remember him driving the like red sports car and like <laughs> smashing into everything. The, the big white scarf. He's that guy. He looks up skirts and he smashes into things. Yeah. He's a man. He's a real American hero. He's a real American <laughs> man. I do remember, again, I'm trying to romanticize it. I'm like, but remember how lovely it is. I remember at the end when Alan, as you would have trouble with, can't get over the fact that she's a mermaid in a tank and she's about to be dissected. And so he's going to give up on it. And it's John Candy's character who says, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. I don't connect with anybody. You had love and you're letting a little thing like her being a mermaid <laughs> get in the way. Um, but I loved that scene. I loved that scene for some reason. Maybe it's because I'm a little hungover because I did record Drunk Women Solving Crime last night. <laughs> I have an emotional hangover. That's what you've got to do. You know, it's, it's your job. <laughs> it's my job. I have to commit to it. <laughs> I take it very seriously. Those crimes don't solve themselves. <laughs> they really won't. And they won't solve themselves sober. That's for sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> You know. <laughs> That's why those drives to work are getting more dicey every day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny because John Candy, I always refer to him by the actor names because I, I never write them down. I think it's Freddie is his, the character. Freddie, it is. It is yeah. Freddie. And, and his sort of crowning achievement as he turns up in this sports car is, they printed my letter in Penthouse. Oh, that's right. Just to show he is this sort of arch sex pest. Yeah, pervert. yeah. I don't know. Does he frame that? And because he's giving copies to everyone, and yeah, you know, I, I know for for this age, you know, people have every access to everything online. I don't even know if Penthouse exists anymore. Mm. I mean, this is in my day, you'd have to go through the bush at the back of a rugby stadium to find that sort of quality. But uh... yeah, the good old days, it was hard <laughs> to find. Everyone, I, do you know what? This is the universal story here. Is it's always like behind a tree, behind a bush. It's like this under. <laughs> Understood, wink wink thing with guys here like we had to go behind a bush like it's always behind a bush <laughs> it's weird because it generally is though yeah well hey hey yeah i remember that and I, oh my gosh and then they have this secretary again this is such 80s humor like she's basically got dementia but we're laughing at her <laughs> Because she's been struck by lightning. Right, right. Oh, no, she's been struck by the. Oh, okay. At least they explain it with, like, an injury. Yeah. Because then a brain injury is hilarious. That's fine. It's lightning. Because I remember as a kid, I'm, I totally didn't understand all the sex parts at all. I had no idea they were having sex. I was like, oh, they love each other. They're kissing. That's all they do. Because um, I remember even thinking in that scene you reference, like, when he's trying to get into the bathroom, I'm like, oh, no, he's going to see her naked. <laughs> How awkward. Um, but there's a scene where she's got her bra on the outside of her clothes. Yeah. And I remember as a kid, like that was the most shocking part of the movie for me, which says a lot. Cause I also didn't think it was weird that John Candy was looking up women's skirts. I was like, well, that's what boys do. And this is how we get socialized. Yeah. We <laughs> he's, he's 10 years old when he first does it. And he obviously, he obviously finds it successful. I mean, why, why change a winning habit? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. One thing I did see was um, Daryl Hannah can't pronounce, or she does pronounce her name, but it sounds like a dolphin oh, yeah. and breaks all right. the TVs. So she, he names her Madison because that's what a man does. He gives you a name and sure. <laughs> based on where you are, which is, I suppose, yeah. your origins of Brooklyn Beckham or KFC Jones or whatever. <laughs> this was the bit where on IMDb, mm-hmm. this, that actually credits this film with the popularity of the name Madison. Yeah. Which I, I wasn't sure whether, is that a legit thing or is that just... Oh, I think, I, I'm i sure it's legit. That's what I always associated with because, oh, and that name stayed popular for so long. I think they can take credit for that. I definitely wished I wanted to be her. I wanted my name to be Madison. I wanted to wear the shoulder pads. <laughs> I wanted everything. <gasps> that rem- And then the other scene that I still love. See, there are great comedic moments in here. I will defend so many moments of this film. When they're out to dinner and she bites into the lobster. Oh, yeah. It's so classic because it just the way he delivers looking sideways like she's really hungry. I just love it. I so love it. But it's strange because, you know, she excused that as, oh, that's how we eat lobsters where I'm from. And, and as you said earlier, this is where he's kind of got the impression that she's a, a refugee or she probably quite literally fell off the boat and landed on Liberty Island. Yeah. Um, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, but why is this such a big deal? Maybe maybe there was some social commentary underneath. Oh my God, she could be Irish. 
<laughs> this is really about the plight of the Irish when it, when it comes down to it, isn't it? Yeah, but then it would have had her having some joke about eating a potato or something. <laughs> yeah. He he asks very few questions. I think we can put it that way. Like it's the sex is good. She's good looking. She learns how to speak from the TV. Like why ask where you're from? Because in the eighties we didn't know about other countries. <laughs> no, I mean why she t- she ask? turns up at Liberty Island. I mean that's hey. that's where most of the immigrants used to turn up, isn't it? Exactly. That's how the U.S. has done it for a long, long time. I saw that Godfather. I know it works. Yeah. 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 Pick out the sexy ones. <laughs> mate with them. Welcome to America. I remember there being a sequel to this film. Because it was, it was one of these straight-to-video ones, and it did make it all the way here. And it was Splash 2, but it was the sort of 2 with a T-O-O. Oh, boy. Splash 2, more splashy. Yeah. Now, I mean, jumping ahead, but everyone's seen this bloody film. Now, obviously, they end up together in their, in their way. Eventually, once they had their sort of escapade of breaking her out of the is it the natural history museum or something like that oh yeah i suppose it was yeah 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 yeah. he's got her there under observation they're going to dissect her and then freddie they disguise themselves as the scientists right and they go and the Swedes, rescue her yeah. but she's got to go back to the water there's this weird like expiration date like she's allowed to be on land for seven days and then was it she something, dies. something like the she said the moon or, ugh, i wasn't even paying attention i think she if she stays there for longer than this random number of days, she becomes human and thus has to stay. Mm. But then when they break her out, and I, now I've only been to New York a couple of times, so I don't know the geography particularly well, but um, the drive that they took from the museum mm-hmm. to to the docks, I, I don't mm-hmm. know if that's like a the sort of stupid ones you get in Notting Hill where they sort of, right, now they're in East London, now they're in South London, how do they, <laughs> they get there? I would have to rewatch that sequence. Yeah, it, it was. It was just, I mean, again, it was like from an outsider, it probably looks perfectly normal. But um, they get to whichever part of the river it was, and and they jump in. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. because they've established that if he's with her, mm-hmm. he he can breathe underwater. Yeah, like she has some magic force field or something. Yeah, because that's how she stayed. Because she didn't tell him that she was the girl from the nineteen sixty four. No, it's only right before they jump in and he says it was you, right? And that's when he remembers, hey, wait, I I can live underwater. The most unrealistic part of this film is not that she's a mermaid and that Tom Hanks can survive underwater. It's that as soon as they dive into what what I think is probably the East River in New York, which is some of the filthiest water ever, they're immediately surrounded by coral and this like tropical fish. They're hidden underneath the shopping carts and the old boots. Yeah, that's the least believable. Like, we should see, like, old mafia murder victims <laughs> in concrete, like, body parts. But no, we see coral and fish, and it's all beautiful. Either that or they can swim really, really quick. Maybe. But, I mean... But, I mean, they they managed to go to their underwater kingdom or whatever it is, because she's had to tell him, what you can never go back. You yeah, know, you, your family have to, you know, assume that you died jumping. Yeah, over. and for a second he's like, "My well, my brother's an asshole and a pervert, so I don't think he's worth sticking around for." Yeah, because <laughs> then he go they they go off, and this is where the sequel comes in. Is that okay? Apparently, he gets a bit like, "Oh, I really want to see my family," and he has to then they go back to New York. She becomes a house, and now it's not Tom Hanks and Daryl Hannah; it's some. Bloke. In in very smart moves for both of them, they yes. did not accept the roles. No, I, I, <laughs> I mean, two. I mean, Tom Hanks. This I think it came out sort of eighty eight, eighty nine. So obviously he was an even bigger star by then. Sure. Um, so I don't. I can't even remember the the name of the guy who was in it. And I think the, the woman had been in. I think Mask and Problem Child and those sort of era films. They had to go okay. back to New York, and basically act like, oh yeah, like I've just been on traveling or whatever. And I I read the reviews of it because I, I did see it once, and I sort of you I'm did correct. see it. I did see it wow, again when I was probably <laughs> when would eighty nine? So I'd have been what nine ten. I um, can't help that I've got to Google it and look up some pictures. Yeah, it's if I just remember it being fucking dreadful. And well, of course, for the same reason that you don't make Crocodile Dundee two 
and reverse the location. Like, no, we liked the journey the way it was. Go from <laughs> Australia to New York. Whoa, that's fish out of water. <gasps> See what I did there? Nice. Yeah, you don't want to get the fish back out of the water once she's already been out of the water. <laughs> we haven't got enough fish puns in here. Maybe at the end I'll, um, well, it's not going to work for a podcast if I hold up a sign just saying Finn. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It worked enough for me. All oh, listen to your dog. He's like, "This is bullshit. What are you doing? <laughs> nobody's home. I know nobody's home. Rich, come get me." Uh, there's somebody at the door. I'm try. I'm translating your dog pretty well, by the way. I don't just solve crimes. I can also speak canine language. Well, if if you know anyone who speaks fish, then maybe we could recreate the film. It's true. I'm reading the synopsis of Splash 2. Now I'm obsessed with... Oh, go, go on. Re- read it out live. Treat, treat us. Set four years after the events of the first movie, Alan Bauer, played by Todd Waring, and his wife Madison, Amy Yazbek, yeah, you know, one. not sure I'd have to click on a mermaid, have been living on a deserted island hideaway. Alan is bored with life on the island. I mean, that's just depressing. And admits he misses New York City and his older brother, Freddie. It doesn't even say who Freddie's played by. <laughs> <laughs> Uncredited. <laughs> Madison has the magical ability to view images and communicate by running her finger in a circular motion over <laughs> liquid water. Oh, no. <laughs> forced trope for the plot she uses this method to show alan how things are going on back in new york with freddie oh sorry played by donovan scott oh him don i mean they go into great detail but i think i think that's all we need to know this is one of those and and forgive me i always mention this uh was it superman 2 they suddenly give superman a load of new powers that no one knew about and maybe this is one of those things where it's like right okay now, no one's going to watch this, but how can we make it seem like she's magic? Right. Let's upgrade. Let's upgrade. Being a mermaid's not enough. And then, yes, as exactly as you said, Madison agrees to be a housewife and adjust to life on land. Because that's what life on land is. Like, give her a job. She's got magical skills. Like, let her work at least in a bodega. Come on. So, but And this was my sort of query, was when at the end of the film, when they go and live in Mermaid City or whatever, um, does he become a house husband or a fish husband and she goes <laughs> off to work? <laughs> because he doesn't develop a tail. So he's still got legs and it's still Tom Hanks. Yeah, he's basically just slowing her down. Like, that's what I thought of when I watched it again. I'm like, man, he's just going to hold her back. And then if he can only breathe underwater if she's with him mm-hmm. she, she can't really go too far probably exactly so quite literally this is a very codependent relationship if anybody's gonna get sick of life under there it's her that's what's bullshit about splash too that's right i'm calling it <laughs> madison would be tired of her like slow ass human husband who has one suit what does he wear under there you know, it's going to be like the cover of Nirvana's Nevermind. Like, he's going to be <laughs> naked with a dangling penis. It's just not a pretty sight. And all the other mermaids will be like, really? Is that the best you could do, Madison? Come on. <laughs> we had high hopes for you. Pick this guy? This guy? Yeah, but at least she knows if she drifts a little bit too far. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> solves that problem. Indeed. Oh, you have to see The Shape of Water. And yes, it's very modern and it's very, it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful film. I, I've heard. It really is yeah. this rebooted in a better way. <laughs> Okay, and and the other way round, so the the woman's the human, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is so what is the bloke? Is that a merman? Oh, it sounds like Zoolander. Uh, is it? It's a fish. It's a fish-like alien creature. Okay, and they fall in. So love. it's a little bit more complex, and it's also um, takes place during the Cold War. So there's a whole there's a whole bit of. Uh, plot in there it's definitely worth seeing honestly i I couldn't when the ads came out i was like seriously i can't uh, forgetting that splash is my favorite film i'm like this is just gross and i was like wait my favorite film was based on a man having sex with a fish so why can't i reverse it this is feminism let's do this but yeah um it's definitely worth seeing well on that subject about now i don't mean to be crude but they have gone to underwater world um she's still a fish He's, yeah, he's still Tom Hanks. How are a, they doing she, it? Well, th- there are some options, I guess, but it's going to get quite boring. Yeah, limited, limited oral slash. And what can he do for her? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because what what does a mermaid like? I don't know. 
How does that work? They should have explored that in a sequel. They really should have. I mean, you could get very graphic because fish reproduce basically like they don't make contact. They just release, you know, their sperm into the water and then the, you know, female fish just kind of swims into it. That's what I would have liked to see in Splash (laughs) 2. But the dirty old man in the local swimming pool releasing his sperm into the water. No, no, the lovely Tom Hanks lookalike. That's all I'm saying. Very sweet scene. And not John Candy. And please not John Candy. <laughs> Bless him. This was funny because, I mean, obviously John Candy sort of had one of these sort of stars that burned very brightly. And this was probably one of the films that he initially, anyway, came across as crass. Really unlikable. Yeah, he's a really unlikable character, which is funny. Yeah, because I remember every other film, even an Uncle Buck where he's kind of... Um, I wouldn't say crass, but he's just, he's so likable yeah. in that role and every other role. Gosh, we used to watch a lot of John Candy films. I'm just having flashbacks to like me and my dad watching I mean, it's every fun. I, John Candy film. I watched Planes, Trains and Automobiles recently and, and he's oh. just this, such a sweet guy who, yes. you know, he's, I mean, it is well-intentioned. He does come across as a bit of an oaf, but he's he's just such a nice guy. And, and of course, the, the ending of that, which heart rendering um i love i love that film have you done that one i have yeah oh it's so good it's so good those aren't pillows (laughs) and the scene where steve martin just swears at that lady is so great it's so great oh it's amazing and she only needs to say it once yeah (laughs) And this, and uh, again, one one of the bits we skirted over where they're trying to get into the museum, and this going very backwards and forwards. But again, it's John Candy's knowledge of Swedish pornography that manages to blag him into the museum, because of course the U.S. Army soldier is half Swedish. I, I don't know if that's a common thing. Oh my gosh, I don't remember this. Yeah, so when when um, Eugene Levy. Tom Hanks and John Candy turn up to rescue Madison. Yeah. Um, and they're po- like, so Eugene Levy's the doctor and they're posing as these two Swedish scientists. Um, and the guard is like, oh, I'm half Swedish and starts talking to them in Swedish. Oh, okay. And because John Candy has seen a lot of Swedish pornography mm-hmm. um, and this is put on the subtitles, I think he says, hey, babe, I have a 12 inch penis. Okay. And then the guard kind of chuckles and goes ah okay carry on it's almost like you're funny come on in (laughs) because you don't need id oh it's just really lazy 80s writing isn't it (laughs) oh do you know what this is this is kind of depressing in a way because there's a part of me that needs to hold on to my love of this film but you know what i think i ruined it when i when i rewatched it as an adult I think I think I knew I had to bury this one. I get the three stars on IMDb. That's probably what I'd give it. But it <laughs> it is sad when you really break it down. You're like, oh, there's so much silly, dodgy stuff. Maybe we'll have to do a cut of the podcast that cuts out all the nasty, horrible porn bits and releases no. a, sort of a PG-friendly family version. That's what's funny. This was rated PG, and I even remember like... Oh, that's the other thing that shocked me. It was like the woman with the bra on the outside. And I think you sort of see like a little bit of Daryl Hannah's boobs. And it was like, (gasps) I can't believe mom and dad are letting me watch this. This is crazy. (laughs) Imagine being a boy. You know, if there's if there's a theme in this film, which is you can never go back. You know, that's what Alan was faced with. I think in a way, some films like this, like you can just never go back. Because I go back to this and I go, this is a, this is a me too disaster. <laughs> well, he's quite literally abandoned his family chasing tail. Oh, there you go. You made up for the lack of Got puns one. there. Got one in. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, so this film, problematic, would you say, or just not as you remembered? It's both. <laughs> it's both. Both. And do you know what it makes me think? I hate when people are like, you know what changed me is now I have a daughter, so now I respect women. I didn't before. I had to have a child to give a shit. Um, but as a woman, I feel like I can say it in a different way because I have a daughter, and I was picturing watching this with her when she's old enough, and I just... I would have to pause it like 20 times and be like, so that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, you know, when you have to do that, it's just, yeah. And I, I can say, because, I mean, that's one of the common things, isn't it? It's like the whole, well, not all men are like that. So if you fucking are. <laughs> but, you know, as the father of daughters, would you? And this is when, well, Daryl Hannah essentially 
falls in love with a guy and she sells her whatever necklace to get him a statue and it's it's sweet in a way if you if tom hanks was a bit more likable wasn't such a prick and i actually wrote down well, see, I, actually, I still find him very likable even though he's doing that's just how good tom hanks is i'm like no tom hanks is nice even though he's making very inappropriate choices true i, that's I mean the I, power of hanks but yeah, yeah here he is I hear what you're saying. Well, ne- next time I have a woman in the bathroom who's not unlocking the door, I'm just going to kick it in. And <laughs> You might have to. You have two daughters. That might be what it comes down to. Yeah. You've been in there for three days. <laughs> do you know who's paying the bills? One of them. Anyway. Right. They should do a decent remake of this. I think this is the answer. Not a sequel. They need to reboot it. With big names and better writing, take out the creepy bits. Because what I love is, I love a rom com with a f- like fantasy angle to it, and you don't see as many of them. Like there was just this sort of license to, again, I can't even throw Shape of Water in there because it's just such a that's a much bigger, more epic film. Like I'm not, you don't call that a rom com. It's much heavier than that. So I love the fantasy element of this, but I feel like you could have a. A mermaid that doesn't, you know, has a say in things a little bit more. I don't know. Can I I ruin your day or this could be the worst week ever? Um, I'm just going to read you something from The Guardian in 2016. Uh, Okay. Chris Hemsworth's turn in Ghostbusters has paved the way for Channing Tatum to score comedy points as a merman in a remake of the 1984 Tom Hanks film. What? Yeah. But that was 2016. Yeah, so it's two years ago, so I don't know if this is one of these ideas that was floating around. and It's probably falling apart. Yeah, this would have been before The Shape of Water. That that would be the problem, that it would be, if you're going to reverse the genders, there's going to be compare. But also, can we just, a merman, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Again, it's very... Um, Blue Steel. What's the film you referenced? Zoolander. Yeah. Zoolander. It's just too Zoolander. <laughs> Especially and with water. Channing Tatum. It's made of life. Like you just no. I can't. No. Mm-mm. But then even then, you know, just scrolling down, they've described this film as a preposterous male fantasy. And that's mm-hmm. pretty much it. Yeah, you nailed that at the beginning. And hear me at the age of 10, I didn't know anything except a preposterous male fantasy. I didn't know there was any other version of events. <laughs> so, oh, how I've grown. Well, for the better, though. Yeah. Yes. Still like that lobster scene, though. <laughs> See, that's a different lobster scene from Flashdance. So there's something different there. Oh, God, that's right. Oh, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> that is one of the cringiest scenes. Yes. She's so gross in that moment like we made mad passionate love because she's such a bad actress too so she can't even and who would do like who would find that endearing like isn't she great the bloke who's twice her age great and she's licking lobster meat like come on right so uh there's me holding my big sign saying finn (laughs) your podcast drunk women solving crime has come out of it sounds horrible to say come out of nowhere but it started very recently and No, it's... that's accurate. <laughs> we are reeling from the response that it's gotten. Yeah, um, not not just the free gin and beer. But... Uh, no, no, I mean that helps with the reeling, <laughs> but um I mean obviously we we were excited about it and we put a lot of work into it because we recorded a lot of episodes before we released and you know, we were proud of the concept and all of that. So obviously, you know, we were trying to promote it, but that only goes so far and we just we never imagined we would get so many listens and such a response. And um, we're now doing our first live dates. So we have a uh, November 1st show at the Pleasance in Islington. Um, and it's going to be a double episode recording. We haven't announced the guests yet. But um, I mean, you know, our first our first guests were Catherine Ryan, Claire Sturgis from Absolute Radio and London Hughes. Um, so we had a like really big launch with those three Um and people just really seem to want to do it. So I think I think we're going to nab some pretty good guests and it should be pretty good. I went to the Pleasance a few months ago to see something and it, it was a nice little venue. It's great. It's really great. Yeah. And again, this is just maybe uh, people have a hankering for true crime and, and all that with the those Netflix ones and that. And, uh, giving it a nice twist because looking back at these old... Co- and, I, you know, I listened to one's 
you know you're going back to what 1800s things like that yeah we we stick with mostly historical crime i guess technically all crime is historical because it's in the past but um unless it's being committed right now because it's a comedy podcast um we wanted to stick with cases where look let's make sure the people involved in this are long gone and so we can feel free to talk about it and we're we're not making fun of of victims we're just looking at the story because it's the details in these cases that are just so fascinating it's so fascinating um but we also have you know the guests come on and they share their experiences of being victims of a crime and it's everything from really ridiculous silly things to things that are full on but it's kind of a way this thing with the true crime craze women are the biggest consumers of true crime and those numbers are only growing and I think it's this thing of you know we're taught to be so wary of uh, a crime happening at any minute we're vulnerable you know don't don't walk down a dark alley don't do this there are murderers all around and I think in a way perversely consuming it sort of gives us a sense of of power over it so that's sort of the that's the idea of it being all women and you know better when you're drunk right <laughs> <laughs> like most things well and we're told again as women we're told like don't don't get too drunk because you'll be vulnerable and it's always put on us and i think in a way that was that was our angle it's like no fuck you we're gonna get hammered and we're gonna solve these crimes that have already happened you need to think Sorry. outside the box <laughs> yeah. the box of wine am i right uh, oh hello and of, course, and of course some of these you're actually working to solve current ish crimes because you have your uh listeners sort of chirping in with their grievances we do and we're always open to listeners sending in their own crimes that we quote unquote solve for them hopefully yes. no nothing to do with neighbors and hamsters or whatever the the latest one was <laughs> yeah oh that was sinister though yeah the roommate who's yeah hamster went missing and like sinister texts from the roommate i'm gonna kill that thing and then it was missing like very dodgy stuff very oh, dodgy shocking well as long as it's not fish going missing or anything like that we, we don't have to worry too much we just did a fish one that's so funny the one we recorded last night ah uh, we had a uh, louise wenner from sleeper i had such a crush, um, crush on her in the 90s yeah, I mean, what's so far? I kind of knew about them, having not grown up with them in the in the states. They weren't well known, but it's so funny just seeing the response because we put up pictures and everybody's like, "Oh my god, Louise Winter!" And she was just the loveliest, loveliest person ever. But yeah, we tackled a we tackled a goldfish crime. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, Taylor, it's been an absolute treat having you on. Now, you're on Twitter at Taylor Glenn UK. I am. Drunk Women Solving Crime is Drunk Women Pod. That's right. Available in all the usual good and bad social media exactly. places. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And um, Just try and not find us. You will find us. That was terribly phrased. What the fuck was that? I will Cut change, that out. I'll, I'll change the voice on it so it sounds a lot more menacing. <laughs> Do you just try to just do it? Oh just my goodness! Anyway, like, like and like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> well, Taylor, as I said, it's it's been a treat. Pleasure's all mine. Yeah, and as usual, I'll play the podcast out with the song that was number one in the UK when this film was released in oh June 1984, and it okay. was Two Tribes by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Okay, and was that the UK charts or US charts? UK charts. Ah. Um, I'd have to find a whole new website for the US ones. Well, then that would be so confusing and you'd be pandering to the Hollywood scene. So you stay true to yourself. Yeah, we'll keep this um, British. That's there's right. Probably, there's probably a remake in there somewhere. They'll gloss this up and it won't be recorded in my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> I'm sure that was on the charts in the US anyway. So Yeah. There we go. Win-win. They, win. they all love Relax. Like them. Yeah. Anyway, Taylor, thank you very much for calling in. and um, You're so to welcome. Soon. Speak to you soon. Thank you. This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, 
an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.